Welcome into the program. Thank you so much for being with us on this Friday. It is the end of the week. Guys, we made it. Weekend is coming up, and I know that I'm looking forward to it. I'm guessing that you guys probably are, too. Most of us have a three-day weekend because, of course, this Monday is going to be the day that we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and I feel that that's only appropriate. Now, his actual birthday, of course, is the 15th, but we always celebrate it on that third Monday. So we will not be here on Monday. We will be out, but we'll be back on Tuesday. So just make you aware of that. Don't freak out that I've gone. It's Martin Luther King Jr. Day. I won't be here because of that. So, um, or if you're working for the state, there's also the uh, Robert E. Lee's birthday to be celebrating as well because they, they have that as well. So uh, they just kind of celebrate it jointly. But anyway, um, two men that shaped the country in very different ways, but both people who were ardent patriots and heroes and uh, really did, in many ways, stand up for the rights of all, both of them. So uh, let's actually go on to the news of the day. We've got quite a few things to tackle in local news, and it is interesting that here recently a lot of my local news coverage has had national implications and a big part of that, I wouldn't say that the only part of that for sure, because there's also been some some buzz with Bradley Byrne. Um, there have been other movers and shakers from the state of Alabama in the national spotlight. But I have to say here recently, one thing that has really been sort of a consistency is that Mo Brooks seems to make headlines, I don't know, seemingly every other day. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the background here and to, to set the stage and give you a little context. And then we're going to get into specifically what Mo Brooks said, because it was in reaction to this situation. And so because it is in reaction to something, I do want to just sort of make you aware of that. And, and just so you know exactly what is going on. So yesterday, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, suggested that Trump propose his, or sorry, postpone his State of the Union that was originally scheduled for January the 29th. Now, we're sitting here at the 18th, so there is a little bit of time. There is a possibility that the shutdown is not going to continue that long. It may not. It could end today, for all we know. But we are in the longest shutdown in American history. And because of that, they are anticipating that they will not have the resources to be able to host the State of the Union for security reasons. That's at least the stated reason. Now, anybody with a brain, anybody on the left that's honest with themselves will quickly admit, and I've seen people on the left to, to say this, uh, I mean, for goodness sake, even uh, what's his name, old Chris Cecilia, who is a far, far, far to the left, a journalist on CNN and somebody that really hates President Trump. Even he has reprimanded Nancy Pelosi for stooping to this kind of tactic. But what she did was she originally suggested that he postpone it, and then she basically just disinvited him and cited security reasons for the reason that they will be unable to host the president as, uh, as is usually done in the House. And, of course, we, we all know that that's typically where it takes place is that the president goes to the House for a joint session of Congress. That's actually what's going on there, for those of you who didn't know, is that the State of the Union is actually a joint session of Congress. It's not just something that they do for show. It actually is a part of the Constitution. And so because of that, even though we'll get into some of the history and how that has changed over the years in a second, but that's traditionally, at least for the past uh, about 80 years, the way that the State of the Union has been delivered. So because of this, even though Nancy Pelosi knows this, she's saying that because of the shutdown, that they're not going to be able to provide security for that, which is a stupid and childish move by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, Nancy Pelosi just wants to find a way to stick it to Donald Trump and to make him feel the effects of the shutdown, which Democrats seem to, and this goes all the way back to the Obama administration and the shutdown in 2013, they want to make people really feel and hurt when a shutdown happens. They really want people to feel the impact of it, whereas Republicans try to mitigate the impact of a shutdown. I mean, if they believe that there's something that justifies a shutdown, they'll certainly do it, but they want it to be as painless as possible and just want it to kind of pass in the night, regardless of who happens to actually instigate it. Now, again, as I've always said, and I know I've said it to him blue in the fa face, 
unless you have a majority in the House, a supermajority in the Senate, and the White House, no one party can bear the blame for a government shutdown. It always, unless you have all three of those conditions, takes both sides of the aisle to be able to shut the government down. And this one is no exception. But even when Democrats are kind of the ones that started it, even when Democrats are the ones that have the the issue that they don't want to open the government for, even then, Republicans still don't try to make people feel the pain of a shutdown. It's just not in their nature. It's not who they are. It, to my knowledge, that's never happened. Maybe you can go back in history and correct me if I happen to be wrong on that, but especially in my lifetime and, and what I've seen, it's the Democrats that usually go out of their way to make people feel the effects of the shutdown. We, of course, remember when Barack Obama was actually hiring and spending more money than he would have had the government not been shut down, government employees to go out and literally chain up swing sets in the parks in D.C. there and going out of their way to spend actually extra money to close down roads and memorials and try to stop even open-air monuments and memorials from being seen by veterans and people that were coming there to be able to see the monuments that they went out and they fought for. And even the ones that were actually funded by private dollars, not federal dollars, they still actually hired people to go out and put chains and fences around those things, which was utterly stupid and ridiculous on a number of re, uh, on a number of levels. But the point is, traditionally, Democrats seem to be the ones that try to make people feel the effects of the shutdown the most. The Republicans tend to not do that. That's just really not who they are. And another thing, too, that should be noted about this is that it's blatantly false that they would not be able to handle security for it. In fact, Homeland Security Secretary Christian Nielsen said the Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Secret Service are fully prepared to support and secure the State of the Union. So, in other words, the person that would be the head honcho, the one that was actually in charge of securing the State of the Union is saying, yeah, we're fully prepared. In fact, we would have no more or less security if the government wasn't shut down. This is not a factor. The State of the Union is no less safe because the government happens to be shut down when it would be taking place. And that's exactly what you would expect, and that's exactly right. So the question is, if that's the case, then why is Speaker Pelosi so bound and determined to stop the State of the Union from happening? Well, the first reason I think we, we've already made clear, it was a political move, it's something that we've been talking about since we brought this topic up, is that she wants to make the president feel the effects of the State of the Union. However, I think there's actually a secondary reason as well. And I say secondary as though it's unimportant, but believe me, it is important. In fact, there is a question in my mind as to whether or not this was actually the real motive. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer got absolutely shellacked when it came to the State of the Union, or sorry, the uh, Oval Office address. You'll remember we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, is that the president decided to address the union from his Oval Office, from the Resolute Desk, and did so in about eight minutes, making the case for border security. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer came on directly after that, and tried to offer a rebuttal. And whereas Trump's address was, by any measure, informative, solid, uh, there were very few problems or inconsistencies that went on there. Uh, there were very few things that he said that I found problematic, and that a lot of so a lot of political commentators even said that it was a a well organized speech and a, a well-done speech, even if they didn't necessarily agree with the content per se. Although in that particular case, most of the content was not opinion anyway. It was mostly just facts and statistics when it came to the border. And so that they didn't even really argue with. They just argued with the tone or whatever else. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I have no reason to go through the whole thing again. But the point is, you compared that with the reaction of Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and their rebuttal was largely met with laughs and internet memes. And it really did not go over well for them. And so the lesson, the moral of the lesson there, and we actually went over this when we were talking about that particular address, 
is that Trump is doing better. And the longer this shutdown goes on, the more people actually blame the Democrats and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer than they do President Trump. We showed you a poll that was taken on December 17th and then one that was taken the night of the Oval Office address. So, uh, you know, about three weeks later. And it showed that Trump, far less people blamed Trump in that time period, and far more people were starting to blame the Democrats. And if we take took another poll today, I'm sure that that, or I'm guessing that trend would continue because there's no reason to believe that anything would have changed on that. And so Nancy Pelosi understands that Trump being able to directly address the American people is not going to be a win for them. Him having the bully pulpit and being able to talk to people that normally aren't paying attention, I don't think she estimates is going to be something that is favorable for them. And part of the reason is because their side of the argument is completely irrational and illogical. And anybody that watches them can tell they really just want want open borders. Because none of the arguments that they're making for the wall being ineffective make sense. And here's another thing that anybody that is thinking through this will quickly come to the conclusion the wall cannot be simultaneously immoral and ineffective. You can make the argument that the wall is ineffective, but if you do, then you're saying it doesn't stop anybody from coming in and thus it can't be immoral. And if you're saying it's immoral because it keeps people out, then you're saying it is effective. It just happens to be mean and bad to keep people out of this country that aren't supposed to be here. And so either way, they're caught in this weird catch-22 to where they try to make the moral argument, but if they do, they shoot themselves in the foot when it comes to the effective argument and vice versa. And so Nancy Pelosi, I think, correctly understands that this is not a winning issue for them, and that's why she's trying to keep the uh, keep the president from directly addressing the American people. So that being said, Donald Trump, when he was disinvited by the speaker – to the House to do the State of the Union, he responded in what I believe is the best thing that he has done probably since the beginning of his presidency in terms of trolling. Now, the the burger thing that happened earlier this week with hosting Clemson with fast food, I mean, don't get me wrong, that was ridiculously entertaining, but I think this tops it by a country mile. So this is his letter to Nancy Pelosi. Due to the shutdown, I'm sorry to inform you that your trip to Brussels, Egypt, and Afghanistan has been postponed. (laughs) We will reschedule this seven-day excursion when the shutdown is over. In light of the 800,000 great American workers not receiving pay, I'm sure you would agree that postponing the public relations event is totally appropriate. I also feel that during this period, it would be better if you were in Washington (laughs) negotiating with me and joining the strong border security movement to end the shutdown. Obviously, if you would like to make your journey by flying commercial, (laughs) that would certainly be your prerogative. Ouch. I look forward to seeing you and even more forward to watching our open and dangerous southern border finally receive the attention, funding, and security it so desperately (laughs) deserves. Okay, so this is just... I mean, that's a Trump move. Nancy Pelosi did something childish and petty, and Donald Trump responds by being equally childish and petty, only his actually does come up as being a little bit more reasonable. But nonetheless, that's really not the point. He hardcore trolls her. So she tried to troll Trump, and Trump trolled her much harder than she did him. And that's what's so hilarious about this. This may be the best stunt he's pulled since being president. There have been quite a few that I've found entertaining. And I love that he suggests flying commercial at the end there. I mean, Nancy Pelosi is a rich person. She has the money, and he's saying, look, if you still want to go, that's fine. You're not flying on the taxpayer dollar. I don't know. That was just hilarious, the idea of Nancy Pelosi flying uh, in a coach seat to you know wherever else it is that she's supposed to go over there over in Brussels and Egypt and the other places that he mentioned. So here's really where all this goes down to. Nancy Pelosi did something really stupid in trying to troll the president because she is going into a fight on his territory. You don't act petty and childish against pr- the president because he's the best at it. He's wonderful, he's the best, he's the everyone's saying it. 
Trump is the best at trolling people. And so you don't get into a troll war with Trump because he's so good at it. It's like trying to go after the human torch with a flamethrower. It's not going to end well. It doesn't affect him. And so she tried to stick it to the president, and the president stuck it to her twice as hard. It was hysterical. Um, but it's it's kind of like this. If you're having a problem with an alligator, you wait till the alligator comes on land to attack it. You don't go into his element and try to force your way on him in that regard. Because if you get in the water, all he has to do is clamp down on you and hold you underwater until you, you drown. I mean, you don't go into his turf. You don't fight on his battleground in order to try to win a victory. You just wait for him to come onto your turf, and then you try to smack him. Nancy Pelosi tried a, a sort of a juvenile and partisan trick on Trump, and then he goes back and hits her with more of the same and hits her harder than she initially hit him. And so it was just hysterical the way that he did that. And should, she should have seen this coming. She really should have seen this coming because we all remember what happened when Marco Rubio tried to out Trump Trump. You remember that during the presidential debates that Marco Rubio tried to make sort of a lewd joke about his hands and other things being small. And that's how I'll leave it at that. And he tried to basically play Trump's game and get under his skin and, you know, basically argue like a five year old, which is Donald Trump's strategy. And it wound up blowing up in his face. And the reason that it did is because he decided to take the fight onto Trump's turf, which is a really dumb idea. You don't try to troll Trump. I mean, he's just, he's so good at it. Now, you want to beat him up on the facts? Yeah, you can do that. In fact, it's not that hard. You want to beat him up on some other levels? Yeah, you can do that. The guy's not a master politician by any stretch of the imagination. But Nancy Pelosi decided to try to hit him where he lives, and it just did not work out in her favor. So there was even a Washington Post piece by a guy named Philip Bump, I believe is his name. And uh, he got it exactly right where he said the purpose of the Trump letter was to own the libs. It wasn't to make some kind of political statement. It wasn't really even to punish Pelosi per se. It was just something to annoy her and to own the libs. So when someone says owning the libs, that means that that person is just doing something to make a, a liberal angry. And, I mean, Trump did it. He absolutely pulled it off. And he's right about that because in so many ways, Trump's campaign as a whole was owning the libs. That's one of the reasons that people liked him. It wasn't that they were so enamored with Trump, even though there were some people that certainly were. It was more that they liked Trump because of how much he disliked Hillary and he was willing to say the ridiculous things, to go after them in the most extreme ways, which, by the way, I mean, in Clinton's case, she totally deserved. But I'm just saying that that's part of the reason that people sort of gravitated to him is because out of all the people, he was the one that was willing to go the furthest and the most extreme when it came to disliking Hillary Clinton and just smashing her rhetorically. And that's what the reason that people gravitated to it. And this was him doing exactly that to Nancy Pelosi. And that's the reason that I think people were so up in arms about it and, and really enjoyed themselves with it. So Mo Brooks our own representative from the state of Alabama, representing up in the Huntsville area. He weighs in on this, and what he suggests instead is that the president use the Senate floor. So instead of going to the House, you just have the State of the Union in the Senate. Now, the Senate is smaller, and that's the reason that they typically have the State of the Union in the House, but the Senate is still big enough to be able to host the State of the Union. It'll be a little cramped, but the point is it can be done there. And so in a press release that Mo Brooks released the other day, he suggests this. So this is an excerpt from that. It is the height of chutzpah, by the way, good use of a Jewish term there, chutzpah, for Speaker Pelosi to feign concern for the president's personal security during the State of the Union address while callously showing no concern for the thousands of Americans who die each year because of illegal aliens and because of America's poorest southern border. Speaker Pelosi's conduct is nothing more than a radical, hyperpartisan, and shameless attempt to appease the Democrat Party's socialist-based and childishly embarrass the President of the United States. Wow. 
I mean, Mo Brooks just goes after her with both barrels there, and he's 100% right. One of the things that he's talking about there, and I think that it is worthy of note, is that if this thing is about security, if you're so worried about security, and that's where this whole thing is going, and of course we all know it's not about security, but that is the stated reason that Nancy Pelosi is disinviting the president. She's saying that it's going to be a security issue. If she's so concerned for the security of the president and the other people in the room, then why is she not concerned about the 15,000 victims of violent crimes at the hands of illegal immigrants because she refuses to even think about trying to secure the border? It's an excellent point. And it doesn't really make any sense that if she's so concerned about security and the well-being of those in Washington – all the people out there in the hazard class, the little people, the peons, the average citizens that are having over 400 or sorry, 4,000 of their lives taken every year and having rapes, uh, having drugs coming across the border. All of those things apparently just don't matter. But if there's even a chance that some of the precious Washington elites, the people that are running this, that they might get hurt, then they then we have to just cancel the whole thing. And again, it really wasn't a security issue. This whole thing was political, and we all know that. But if Nancy Pelosi is going to hang on to this narrative that it was a security issue, then the question is, well, why does she care so much about the security of the people in Washington, the ruling class, as it were, and not the average American citizen? You're not willing to expend even $5.7 billion to try to secure the border, to try to help them. But you're terribly worried that there's even a chance that something might happen to you up in Washington, D.C., that we have to cancel that event. It is the height of inconsistency. So Mo Brooks goes on in, later in this press conference, or, or sorry, this press release, and says, What is Speaker Pelosi so scared about what President Trump might say? Is Speaker Pelosi fearful of the truth about dead Americans who lose their lives every day because of Democrat policies that aid and abed? illegal alien homicides, and overdoses from drugs that leak into America like a sieve across our poor southern border. Does Speaker Pelosi fear that the true facts and sound arguments for the border security will expose the Democrats and the national media's hyper-political rhetoric and outright lies and deceit? Well, that's essentially exactly the point that I was making earlier. We've already seen this play out. We saw it play out when President Trump addressed the nation from the Oval Office and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer tried to answer. And whereas Trump was armed with facts and stories of real people that have been hurt by this, Nancy Pelosi comes back with, yeah, but it's just kind of mean. And then Chuck Schumer, hilariously enough, comes back with, well, the, uh, 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 well, the symbol, the symbol of our country. Yeah, that should be the Statue of Liberty. And not the the thirty foot wall. Y yeah, but the Statue of Liberty is on a natural border security measure. <laughs> it's on the ocean. That's the reason we don't have a wall on the coast is because the ocean is a natural barrier for our borders. And the Statue of Liberty stands for legal immigration, not illegal immigration. And so I won't go through that whole thing again. But my point is, their rebuttal was absolutely pathetic. And they know it, and the American public reacted to it. And they know that they can't take another serious blow like that, which is the reason that they're terrified that the State of the Union might actually happen and continue the trend, which, by the way, for President Trump is moving upward, that the American people are going to increasingly blame them and see them as the unreasonable ones, not the Republicans, which I've been saying from the very beginning was going to happen. I predicted this before the shutdown even started. And yet... It seems as though Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are bound and determined to keep that from playing out. So ultimately, this, uh, this is what Mo Brooks suggests is that it should take place in the Senate. And that's sort of how the thing ends, which I agree, not necessarily a bad idea. It's a perfectly fine venue. It'll look good on TV. You'll be able to have most of the people in there. I mean, it's going to be a packed house, but it always kind of is anyway. It's going to be a little more cramped than normal, but I think that's fine, too. But in response to this, I know we've got a lot of responding going on. 
one of our affiliates up in Huntsville, Dell Jackson, who runs a Cumulus show up there in Huntsville. So, you know, one of our partners up there, he is actually suggested in a article on Yellowhammer. His plan is, you know what, Mo Brooks, I like the idea of the meeting in the Senate, but I actually have a better idea. The State of the Union should happen in the Texas desert on the border. At one of the locations that doesn't have a wall and show you how wide open and how easy it is to be able to slip across the border. And he says that basically asserts that that particular place would have more space than the Senate and it would have more meaning, more impact for it to take place there. And Del Jackson's right. There's no rule that says that it has to take place in D.C. In fact, there's no rule that there has to be a speech at all. And so Trump could deliver the State of the Union if he wanted to on the Texas border. And I think that that actually would send a powerful message to this, uh, to the country that this is how important this issue is, that we're going down there for the State of the Union to try to emphasize that we really need to get serious about border security. And if he does that, and I don't know that he will, but if he does that, I do think that it sends a powerful message about how important this issue is to our country and to him personally. So I think it's actually a great idea to have it out there in the open, uh, you know, have it in, in the outside. The only thing I do worry about is since we've been talking about security at this point anyway, it will be a little harder to secure everything there. And I don't know if it needs to take place in, in an open space or right in front of the border wall or however you would do that. But the point is security would be a lot more difficult when you're in an, out in a, a, a big open space like that. But, but it could still be done. I have no doubt that the Secret Service could put together a security plan that's pretty airtight. And so because of that, I actually think this is a really smart idea. However, I actually have an alternate proposal. And this is coming from me. This is just my opinion on what should happen. And it's a little late now for this reaction, but I think if the president had done this from the onset, it would have been just as good, probably not as entertaining, but it would have been just as good policy-wise and just as good politically as his, his coming back with the letter saying, well, fine, you're not going to invite me to the State of the Union? You're grounded. I wish he had done that just like the you're fired thing from The Apprentice. Uh, you're grounded. That's how he should have handled it. But anyway, uh, my proposal is to just cancel it outright. Just not even have a State of the Union. I think that the president already made his case about why the border security is important in the Oval Office address. And let's be honest, most of the people that watch the State of the Union are political nerds that already have their mind made up about Trump one way or the other anyway. And unfortunately, having their mind made up about Trump typically means they already have their mind made up about the border and basically every other proposal that he makes. So even though it doesn't make sense to make that judgment based on who's making the argument, I mean, you're supposed to deal with the argument itself, not the person making the argument. But most people, for whatever reason, don't think that way. They don't think logically. And so most people kind of have their mind made up on that. However, if you were to cancel it, it would still be trolling Pelosi because nobody despises scorn and flippancy more than Pelosi, especially when she's trying to attack you. I mean, you think about it. The best way to get back at somebody who is being childish and is trying to annoy you and antagonize you is to just completely ignore them. So if Nancy Pelosi had said, well, you know what, Mr. President, we don't have the funding for the security because of the shutdown and we're blaming it on you. And so because of that, you're just not going to be invited to the House for the State of the Union. What do you think about that? President Trump could have been like, I'm fine with that. I don't really even like doing the State of the Union. I was thinking about canceling it this year anyway. We just won't do it. I mean, don't you know that that would have annoyed her more than anything? I don't know. Maybe canceling the flight got under her skin more. I'm not sure. I don't know Nancy Pelosi well enough to know which one would have bothered her more. But don't you know that would have just eaten her up inside? And furthermore, it not only serves the purpose of trolling, but it also kind of fits in with, with the president's motif. He's already canceled, for example, the White House Correspondents' Dinner. And look, the State of the Union, the State of the Union is part of the Constitution, but it's actually been presented in written form more often than it has in, in live and in person. The whole live and in person thing to a joint assembly of Congress, that didn't start until, let's see, 1913 with Woodrow Wilson. 
which that in and of itself ought to be reason enough to not want to do a live State of the Union. Woodrow Wilson was a horrible president. I would argue the worst one we've ever had. But anyway, Woodrow Wilson, because he loved pomp, he loved circumstance, he loved feeling like he was a big shot, he decided that he was instead going to deliver the State of the Union, not in letter form, but actually go in front of Congress and make a big deal about it. And so because of that, what you have there is something that reeks of the monarchy. It reeks of the monarchy or dictatorships that you have the head guy come with a pre-scheduled thing and, and give these long addresses to, in the monarchy sense, parliament. It just It's very reminiscent of the way that kings used to address parliament. And I, I just don't like it. I think the State of the Union should be submitted in written form. And because of that, and because it would accomplish essentially the same purpose that Trump did with the letter and grounding Pelosi, that all he would have had to have done is been like, yeah, I'm fine with it. It really doesn't bother me to not do it. That would have eaten her alive. And that's the reason that I think that it would have been so hilarious for him. Politically, though, Politically, because that's not childish and because that's not stooping to her level, then Trump looks more like the adult, in my opinion. And so because of that, I think from a political perspective, my proposal actually works better than what the president did. Because the president is a counterpuncher. I get that. He gets punched. He wants to come back and punch harder. And when you're talking to the media, when you're talking to the Democrats, sometimes that approach is really good. But sometimes it's better and wiser to parry. It's better to, instead of taking an immediate counterpunch, taking the hit and then punching back, instead, just kind of dodging the punch, parrying it off of your weapon, and then taking them from the back. You know, after they're out of their way, after you have moved them to the side and avoided their attack completely and taken no damage from it, then you whack them. And that's exactly from a rhetorical standpoint, what's saying, no, really don't have to do the State of the Union. That's really what that would have done, in my opinion. I think that politically it was the better move. But anyway, that's just my opinion. Because the best way to deal with a bully and to score political points at the same time is to act like you just don't care. By the way, it looks like we've got some visitor comments. My cousin Todd from Kentucky says, uh, like the hat, Caleb. Well, thank you, Todd. I appreciate it. I do love my Atlanta Braves, and this is my favorite hat, actually. So I do appreciate that. And speaking of some uh, interaction from the audience, let's go ahead and go to the phones with John from Millbrook. And I wanted to ask you about this. Uh, We've been talking a lot about the back and forth between the president and Pelosi. You know, the president says, Uh, Or Sorry, Pelosi says, well, fine, if we're going to have a shutdown, then you can't come to the House to do the State of the Union. He says, well, fine, then you're not going on a trip to Europe on the government money on government money. So what do you think about this whole back and forth? Well, I was talking with a young gentleman here in the service station parking lot about the shutdown just a second ago. Really? I would I would rather give you his view, actually. Okay, fine. It's okay, I promise. Uh. He's uh, no names given. I just wanted someone else's uh, position on it to see what the people out there are thinking. And yeah, I love that. Somebody that's radio. not necessarily a, a talk radio person, somebody that really? just has an opinion. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear that. Well, I mean, he said the government shutdown's not bothering him. He's not concerned about it. <laughs> I'm right there with him. You know, it's so I, funny. Hey, Every single we'll morning, I eat breakfast and I turn on CNN. And without fail, every morning this week, CNN has run some kind of story about some poor, pathetic uh, federal employee that is having their life upended, which a lot of the things that they keep talking about really don't sound all that bad. And second of all, they're they're trying so hard to convince us that the government shutdown is a bad thing because the average person out there, they're just kind of looking around and going, yeah, it really doesn't bother me that much. Yeah, well, this gentleman didn't say is it hurting the military? I said, well, it's not affecting them. He said, well, it's not really affecting anybody I know, so I'm not worried. I said, you know, a lot of people are like that. They are. He's, that's not an unusual view. No, not at all. He's a smart young man making a living. He's working hard and doing his thing. And as long as the wind don't blow over him, I don't think he's bothering him very much, like a lot of people. In well, that. that's the thing. The, really, the only people that this is affecting 
is the 800,000 employees that have been furloughed and their families, which 800,000 is a significant number, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned about them, but in a country of 320 million, that's a very small percentage of the population. And on top of that, with those 800,000, they tend to make more money than their private sector counterparts, which means they have the opportunity to save up money. And they also, the federal credit unions have been offering them loans at 0% interest. So they don't even have to pay any interest, and as soon as they get the back pay, they'll be able to pay these loans off. So this idea that they've been massively inconvenienced and their children are starving, because there's no truth to that. It's just yeah. not affecting most people. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll get back to my thing, and I uh, just wanted to weigh in on that and actually just give his opinion, because I think it's important to hear another viewpoint. Absolutely. I agree with you, and I do appreciate that. Thank you for, uh, thank you for sharing that with us. <clears throat> So a little bit of uh, almost housekeeping news, but I do think it is important. Rich Hobson was installed as the director of courts. Now, you may remember Rich Hobson because he was running against Nancy Pelosi in the Republican primary. Unfortunately, he wound up coming in third, which meant that he was actually not in the running for the runoff when that took place, which was a crying shame because we had five, I thought, really good candidates in a really strong field. I say five uh, really good candidates. We had three really good candidates in a field of five, and we picked by far the worst two. Now, I like Bobby Bright personally. He's a very nice person. I've never had any qualms with him on a personal level, but he is a Democrat, and he does tend to lean pretty far left. And Martha Roby, even though she's a Republican, had a more liberal voting record than he did when he was in office. So we were basically dealing with two Democrats. And Rich Hobson wound up not even making it into the runoff, which is a crying shame because that guy is a constitutionalist and is a real conservative. We've been talking so much about in, in this past story what the, some of the stuff that Mo Brooks has done. I guarantee you if Rich Hobson had wound up being our representative, we would have had somebody just as loud and just as boisterous and just as committed to this as Mo Brooks has been. So Alabama would have had two representatives in the spotlight making the case to build this border wall. And I mean, Rich Hobson is just a phenomenal person, somebody that I have a lot of respect for. He was my first pick for the office to represent me in the second district of Alabama. But I think he really is in a position where he can flourish and do a lot of good because as the director of courts, this is a position that he's already held twice under Roy Moore when he was chief justice and chief justice Parker newly elected chief justice Tom Parker spoke very highly of him. He said he's confident that he's going to keep the leftist influences out of the court system, which I know that we all appreciate, especially in Alabama. And he said, quote, there is no one in Alabama who knows and understands the court system better than Rich Hobson. He is an effective, efficient and competent administrator who has hit my philosophy or has hit the ground running like me. Rich Hobson is a strong constitutional conservative who shares my philosophy and it will help keep, help me keep the leftist influences out of our court system. That is very high praise from Tom Parker, a guy that has been a tireless advocate for the Constitution, both America's and Alabama's. And so just wanted to give a kudos to that. And I do think this is sort of a testament to the fact that the Lord does sometimes work in mysterious ways. You remember what happened to Matt Bevin? Matt Bevin, who is the current governor of the state of Kentucky. He originally threw his hat in the ring to run against Mitch McConnell, and he fought tooth and nail, but Mitch McConnell had a very big war chest. He's basically universally known in the state of Kentucky when you're talking about name recognition. And so Matt Bevin, even though he's a real constitutional conservative, he had an uphill battle, and he lost that round. He lost that election. I mean, Mitch McConnell wound up walking away with it. And I'm pretty sure that Matt Bevin felt kind of down and out because of that. However, that experience really helped him find his niche and, and learn how to run a campaign. And because of that, you had him run for the governorship just a few months later. And now he's the governor of the great state of Kentucky. So sometimes the Lord works in mysterious ways. I think that Rich Hobson is really good at being director of courts. 
and he's returning to that role now as well. There were some rumors that I heard going on. There were going to be people trying to oust him, trying to keep him from having this position again. But, you know, just looking at it, it seems as though he's not, well, he has been reinstated, but it seems like he's on the right path. And I would love to see him in a higher position in a different capacity coming up soon, kind of like Matt Bevan. The Lord works in mysterious ways and maybe that will work out for Rich Hobson. So welcome back, Rich Hobson. We are really looking forward to the job that you do there and wish you the best in your future. Hopefully we'll get to see that. So along those lines, since we're talking about the Constitution, there is a new report out by the Justice Department who has shown that most criminals got their guns illegally. And to this, basically everybody said, well, duh. I mean, for anybody that has any walking around sense or anybody that has actually studied this issue, the idea that most criminals are getting their guns illegally, I mean, that kind of makes sense. This idea that criminals are going to a retailer and purchasing their gun, going through a background check, all that stuff. Yeah, not any rational people really believe that. I mean, it happens, but it's rare. And we've seen this time and time again with big stories about mass shootings. We've seen it with stories of individual gun crime that when these events happen, even though occasionally they have purchased their firearm illegally, most of the time what happens is their firearm is either stolen or bought through a black market. And so it's just very rare to see somebody that actually went through the legal process and purchased their firearm in a legal way. It's very rare to see them actually wind up committing a crime with it. And so the DOJ report goes through this. It showed that only 7% out of the 300,000 state and federal prisoners that possessed a firearm during their crimes purchased them from a licensed dealer. So somebody with a federal firearms license, somebody that actually is a retailer because to sell any gun, to sell any gun through a retail business, you have to have a federal firearms license. And so because of that, we're looking at this and only 7% of all of those 300,000 people actually purchase their firearm that way. That's pretty small. And remember, that's just people that possessed a firearm at the time of their crime. That does not mean that they used it. So what we're looking at is if you, for example, got caught for embezzling and wound up in a federal prison, but you happened to own a firearm, they surveyed you too. Which means that the 7% of people that got their guns legally, that means that probably what's happening is there are quite a few in that number they didn't actually use their firearms in the crime. They were just busted for a federal crime and asked, okay, do you own a firearm? Do you own a weapon? Did you own it at the time of your crime? And if so, how did you get that firearm? So there's a lot of probably what we would refer to as nonviolent criminals that would fall into that 7% category. I don't know what that number would be exactly, but we're going to dive into the statistics and try to sort that out here. So remember, that is possessing, not using. So of that number, only 13% of those surveyed used a gun in their crime and only 1.3% obtained it via retail. So 13% saying that they, uh, that they actually used their gun in a crime, only 13% of that 300,000 actually used a gun. And then out of that, only 1.3% obtained it via retail. So in other words, the ones that actually used a gun in the crime that they were committing, only 1.3% actually used their firearm that, that got it through a retail venue. In other words, that purchased their guns in a legal way. Only thir or sorry, only 0.8% got their gun at a gun show. Which, by the way, means that that's about 40% less than traditional retail. And so you'll hear this all the time. They'll say, we got to close the gun sh show loophole. we got to close the gun show loophole. Well, what they mean by that is they're saying what we really need to do is all transactions have to be regulated. So if, God forbid, my grandfather were to die and leave me one of his guns, 
I would be in violation of the law by just being in possession of that gun without going through some kind of registry or figuring out a way to get my gun on the radar for the federal government. You can't transfer a gun without some kind of bill of receipt, a cell, some way to know where all the guns are. So effectively, there is no way to enforce that law unless you have a national gun registry. So when they say universal background checks and closing the gun show loophole, that's what they're actually talking about. All private transactions must be done through the federal government. There has to be a registry of some kind to be able to enforce that. Because I would have to do a background check to receive a gun even from my own grandfather or any other relative for that matter. Anybody, no matter who it was. I would have to go through a background check to be able to obtain it. Which is utterly ridiculous on a number of levels. But you always hear that buzzword. We got to close that gun show loophole. There is no gun show loophole. The same laws apply at gun shows as they do everywhere else. It's true that there are some people that happen to be sellers of guns that are not retail. And so they don't have a booth. They don't have a business or anything. They just happen to be, uh, they just happen to be walking around there and they might meet this guy's like, Hey, you know, that's a nice gun. By the way, I have a, a Remington 870 at the, at, at the house. Really? I'd really like to have a Remington 870. You want to sell it to me? See, in, in the mind of the federal government, the people that are wanting to regulate guns, that should be regulated. You should have to do a background check to do that. There are some people that meet up and do that, but that's very, very rare. And we're looking at it right here, that as far as criminals that used a gun in their crime, 0.8%, not even a whole percentage, got their guns at a gun show. And so it's absolutely ridiculous to believe that quote unquote closing the gun show loophole even if we actually did it and it would be a really bad idea if we did would have this big effect on crime and, and violent crime and gun crime now i always believe in taking the most extreme example sort of a uh, ad absurdium to try to test out a idea so what if we just implemented not just the gun control that liberals are talking about, let's say we went to the far extreme and said, look, we got to get this gun thing under control. So you know what? We're going to repeal the Second Amendment altogether. You do not have a right to own a gun. That means that based on these statistics, even if you got rid of guns completely, said it's no longer legal to even own a gun, that if they got rid of that, that means that 93% of criminals, according to these stats, even if there was no right to own a gun whatsoever in the Second Amendment, 93% of criminals would still obtain their guns. 93% of the criminals surveyed in here would have still got their guns because they didn't purchase it through legal channels anyway. 98.7% of crimes total would be completely unaffected. Because we're looking at the stat there that um, only 1.3% of those that used a gun in their crime obtained it via retail, so that's 98.7% of crimes that were committed with guns would be completely ineffected. 87% of crimes committed with guns would be completely ineffected. So you're talking about crimes that there was actually a gun used in the process of committing that crime. 87% of those crimes, no effect whatsoever. And here's the really staggering when we're talking about the gun show loophole. 99.2% of criminals that got their guns at gun shows, completely unaffected. If you closed the gun show loophole and you regulated that somehow, if you just stopped it in gun shows, 99.2% of criminals that commit crimes with guns wouldn't be affected by that rule at all. Not one bit. But somehow these policies are supposed to save us from the evils of gun violence. No. Even implementing the most radical of all gun control laws would have virtually no effect on crime overall. And these stats bear that out. And I want to point this out as well. Every single one of the stats that I gave you, as ridiculous as that would be, every single one of those operates on the assumption that criminals would not try to obtain their guns in any other way. So, for example, when I say that 99.2% of criminals 
would be completely unaffected if you tried to close the gun show loophole. That's assuming that that 0.8% that did get their guns at a gun show would not try to obtain a gun anywhere else. So they would essentially go to a gun show and go, oh darn, looks like I can't buy a gun. Well, not going to commit any crimes. Not going to try to get a gun any other way. So each of these stats is assuming that that particular person, that particular criminal, is not going to try to get a gun in any other way or try to, to try to obtain one in another way. Because you would think that if they could obtain a gun legally, if that all of a sudden was taken away from them, that they would just ignore the fact that they could buy them illegally. But that wouldn't happen in the real world because, of course, what's going to happen is if they can't obtain it legally, they're going to figure out a way to get it illegally. And so you really solve none of these problems. But this is why study after study after study on gun control shows, whether you're looking at the UK, whether you're looking at Australia, whether you're looking at Canada, it doesn't have an effect on gun violence or gun homicides. Because all you do when you pass these gun control laws is that you outlaw it for the legal citizen. The person that still wants to obtain their guns legally they're going to. That's just how this works. Because criminals, as a general rule, don't follow the law. That's what makes them criminals. And so this study shows that just about all of the criminals that are committing crimes with guns don't actually get them through legal channels. And the ones that do, even if you put that laws, those laws into place, that would assume that they aren't going to try to get them illegally. That basically, once they meet that first barrier... Oh, well, can't get them legally. Guess I won't buy any guns or try to commit any crimes. And so the people that think that gun control would actually work, those people are living in a fantasy world. Not one that's based on facts, not one that's based on statistics, one that is based on their own whims and emotions. I tell you what, we're just going to go ahead and go straight to the daily dose of stupid. Now you messed it up. <laughs> You're stupid. <laughs> So today's daily dose of stupid, sometimes you go over a story and you just get excited when you see that story come back in the news again with a new angle or new information because you like covering the story so much. And this is no exception. And for those of you who don't know about the transgender GameStop incident, I'm just going to go ahead and play that clip for you. This has got to be one of the best clips that I have ever played on the show. I just absolutely love this thing. So uh, this transgender person goes into a GameStop and uh, the guy just calls him sir, probably just out of habit. And you'll see why when you see this person. No, we're not doing credit. You're going to give me my money back. Excuse me, sir. There's a young man in here. Excuse me, it's ma'am. It is ma'am. I can call the police if you'd like me to. You need to settle down. You need to settle down and mind your business, okay? Ma'am, once again, ma'am. I said both of you. No, you said sir. Once again, it's ma'am. I actually said both of you guys. It was a general. Right beforehand, you said sir. Sir? Mother take it outside. If you want to call me sir again, I will show you a sir. I apologize. Mother apologize now. I need your corporate number because I'm going to talk, call them and talk about how I was misgendered several times in the store. All right, so it goes on for a little bit longer, but you've probably seen the video by this point, and he continues to go on and, and swears and all the other things. So, um, the thing is, everything about this guy screams man. I mean, except for the clothes and to a degree the hair. Everything about this guy, physical characteristics, screams, this is definitely a guy. I mean, you look at the face, you look at the body, the build, you look at the voice. I mean, he has a very deep voice. He has a voice that's about as deep as mine. And I have a fairly low register as far as speakers go. And I know because I pay a lot of attention to this stuff. I mean, this is a very burly dude. And quite obviously a man in every sense of the word, except for the fact that he happens to have on pink shoes and skinny jeans and a pink shirt, I guess that is. I don't even know what you call it. But anyway, whatever it is that he's wearing. 
But this is what's so ridiculous about this whole thing. Changing your clothes no longer, no more makes you into another gender than wearing a cape makes you into Superman. Like, me being in women's clothing, if I were to dress in women's clothing, would not make me any more female than putting on a cape would make me able to fly and shoot heat vision out of my eyes. The people that believe that somehow that changes them are completely devoid of any anchoring to reality whatsoever. I mean, if you actually believe that, then you might as well believe that me being able to put on a superhero suit makes me a superhero or putting on a shell makes me into a turtle. I mean, like whatever else it is that if you can just change your gender, then there's really no limitations on what you actually are. And truth means nothing anymore at that point. So another thing that I would like to point out too, how offensive is it? There is a whole group of people now, and not just people in the trans community, but a lot of people out there in the larger community, a lot of people that tend to lean politically left, that believe that basically all being a woman is, is clothing. I mean, essentially, that's what it boils down to. If you believe that you as a man can just change your clothes and, oh, I'm a woman now. Well, then you believe that all being a woman is, is wearing pink shoes and a pink shirt and earrings. Being a woman is far deeper than that. It's not just having the clothes or if you're under, even if you're go, undergoing the surgery and taking it to the extreme, it's not even just having the parts, even though their parts aren't ever actually going to be the way that an actual biological woman's parts are going to be and vice versa if she tried to transition the other way. But even if you quote unquote had the material, being a woman is so much more than having the physical characteristics of a woman. And that's something that I don't think that these people really understand. If I were, and I am offended that there are women that believe that they can be men just by putting on men's clothing. That's not how that works. Being a man has a lot more depth to it. It is a lot more significant uh, from a spiritual sense, from an emotional sense, from a way that, the way that we think, our brain chemistry, everything. You cannot tell me, you cannot make the case that being a man can be all summed up in basically, oh, I'm just wearing a suit now, so I'm a guy. And from the opposite standpoint, like this guy is, you can't tell me that being a woman is just dressing in women's clothing. And so I do find it offensive that they try to mitigate it to just that. But this actually did remind me of another clip that I've seen before. Man gets all squirrely every time this girl calls. Makes a guy think man's keeping secrets from him. Okay, Sean, you want to stop with the whole man thing? Man seems a little irritated lately. <laughs> it's no big deal. It's a girl I dated a long time ago, and it's over. And don't you dare start the next sentence with man. <laughs> Dude's got a problem with the word man. <laughs> uh, I do love me some Boy Meets World, but yeah, that, that's the issue. This guy has a problem with the words that are being used. Dude's got a problem with the word man. Dude's got a problem with the word, sir. So this whole thing spurred on a tirade, a cornucopia of great memes on the Internet. And I just picked out some of my favorites, and I'm going to share, share them with you because it's a Friday show. I want to have a little fun. I think you'll enjoy this as well. Um, at number five, Aquaman, which is incredibly appropriate because he's actually got the long blonde hair that Aquaman sometimes has in the comic book. So Aquaman, that's a good one. I like this one. He ma'am. Because if you're looking at this guy, I mean like with the, the rough, uh, jawline and the sort of long blonde hair, actually this guy really does look like he man. Like he could play he man in a movie if he wanted to. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Oh yeah. No man can kill me. And then of course, in the Lord of the Rings, a one would go, I am no man, but it's ma'am. So solves that problem right there. This guy would, uh, thinks he could kill, uh, the witch King and Agmar. Okay. And number two, this one's really good. Who is this? It's ma'am. She sounds hideous. Well, she's a guy. So if you remember those old, uh, Jake state farm commercials, that's definitely one of my favorites. And this has got to be my favorite. The number one meme that came out of this whole episode Macho Man Randy Savage. Ah, oh, gosh, I love it. The wrestler Macho Man <laughs> Randy Savage. 
<laughs> oh man, that is too good. Anyway, so just thought you guys would enjoy that, have a little bit of fun with that. And, uh, you know, sometimes even though the internet, we complain about social media, we complain about how much time we spend with technology. Yeah, that happens. But sometimes, I don't know, the memes, they just make it worth it. So having a little bit of fun with this and that one. So the new development in this story, because this all, has all happened a few weeks ago, which feels like forever for whatever reason now. But the same person who refers to himself as Tiffany, I don't know what his birth name was, but he refers to himself as Tiffany. They did an interview with a local news station in Albuquerque, New Mexico, because apparently this is where this whole thing took place, Albuquerque, New Mexico. So this is a excerpt from the interview that he did. We're humans just like you. We're people just like you. Um, we have kids. We have parents. We have brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins. Um, we're just trying to live. All right. Well, here's the problem with that. You are a human. You have human rights that are given to you by God, just like everybody else. And no decision that you can make can alienate you from those inherent human rights. And... Looking at this, you know, I, I got to say that if anybody were to persecute you or treat you as anything less than human, then I would speak out of, against it. I would be the one standing up for you. However, there is nothing in the realm of logical theory about human rights that says that other people have to be nice to you or have to participate in your delusions. So that's the thing. Yeah, you're human. I get it. Absolutely with that, nobody should bully you or commit acts of violence against you or anything like that just because you happen to be wrong. Now, I think what you're doing is sinful. I think that it's not healthy for you. But as far as whether or not I think I should be able to force you to make a different decision, no. You're a human being. You're an adult. You can make your own decisions, dumb as they may be. They're your mistakes to make. However, when you're starting to say to me, that I must not only not harm you or not, you know, try to, to go after you or violate your human rights, but you're also taking it a step further and saying, I have to share with you in your delusion and I have to acknowledge your delusion. Then we do have a problem. And then you say, well, we're just trying to live. No, if you're trying to compel other people to assert the same opinion that you have, which is that you're a woman when you're clearly a dude then you're not just trying to live anymore. Then you're trying to compel others to agree with you. And that's not the way that this works. Look, you can believe you're a lady all you want, but I'm not going to believe you're a lady. I'm not going to call you a woman. I'm not going to call you a female. For the same reason, to use my earlier analogy, that just because a guy is wearing a cape, that does not make him Superman. And I'm not going to refer to him as Superman unless I'm doing it tongue-in-cheek or jokingly. And so this idea that you have to, you know, agree with them and, and go into their delusion. For example, what if I did the same thing with you? What if I said, you must refer to me as His Royal Majesty, the Elf King Elrond. And if you don't, I'm going to pitch a hissy fit and kick things over and shout and curse in front of children and that's how I'm going to react to that if you don't do that, if you don't get my way. That's the attitude of a child. You're literally acting like a child. That if you don't go along with my make-believe, you don't go along with my delusions or the way that I see myself and acknowledge that and go along with it, then I'm going to throw a temper tantrum and show my tail. This is not somebody that is emotionally stable or mature. And I really do feel bad for them. So let's go ahead and look at this next little part of this interview. I could I could have reacted a whole lot better, but you know what? I, I look back at it, if I could, I wouldn't change a single thing. I would do it 100,000 times again. I would kick over that display 100,000 times again because my actions were justified. I mean, it was, it was blatant and malicious hate. It was blatant and malicious misgendering. All right, so this really gets down to the core of the issue. That he's saying, you know what, I'd do it again. I would do it again. That even if I had it to do over, even though I am acknowledging that what I did was wrong and that I, to use his words, 
could have handled it better that even though I realized I was doing something wrong, I'd still do it again. doesn't matter to me. And why is that? The rationale that he was giving is, well, because they were, they hate me. And so my actions are justified. No, that's not how that works. It's wrong to hate people. Again, I wouldn't qualify that as hate, but let's just use his standard to play out this argument. Even if you believe that guy hates you, that's still not a justification for you to act badly. There are people that I believe probably hate me. I mean, in my line of work, there's a lot of people that disagree with me. There's a lot of people that are nasty to me for no reason. That does not give me an excuse to treat them in a nasty way or in a hateful way just because I don't like the way that they treat me. Two wrongs do not make a right. And unfortunately, this is the mentality, and it's a very immature mentality, but this is a mentality of a lot of people on the left, that if I'm offended, any action I take afterward is justified because I'm offended. And so it really is an immature way to look at the world. This person apparently just goes through the world like a giant toddler, kicking things over when they don't get their way. And getting angry at you when they don't go along when you don't go along with their misconceptions of the world, their delusions of who they are. Look, you can wear pink shoes and skinny jeans all you want, still doesn't make you a woman, and I'm still not going to say that you're a woman. I'm not going to try to be disrespectful intentionally. I'm not going to go out of my way to be nasty towards you and to hurt you, but I'm still also going to assert that you're very clearly a man. And when I say that, I'm not saying it because I hate you or anything, but I'm, I care about other people too much to lie to them and to allow them to go along with their delusion. There's no other realm when we're talking about psychology or anything that it would be acceptable for the patient that, that's having this problem and gender dysphoria is an actual mental disorder. That for a person to have this problem to just play along with them and to let them go along with whatever realm of make-believe or brand of make-believe that they subscribe to. If you want to do that and you want to dress like a woman and refer to yourself as a woman, that's fine. You're allowed to do that. I don't think that I should legally be allowed to stop you, but I am going to say, uh, yeah, that's clearly a dude and you can't compel me to go along with your delusions. You can't say that, well, I'm just trying to live when you're trying to make other people see the world that you do and get angry and attack, uh, you know, you, this guy thankfully didn't attack anybody and didn't hurt anybody, but you can't just go and, and cause property damage and kick things over and pitch a fit every single time somebody disagrees with you and expect to be treated in a certain way in a civil society. That's not how this works. Even if you believe the guy is being vengeful or spiteful or whatever towards you, that still doesn't give you the right to mistreat others in that process or in reaction to that. And I'm not going to deny science. I am not going to deny what my own eyes see and my own common sense perceives somebody being a guy. So that being said, we're going to go ahead and jump to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Okay, today's Chaplain Report it comes from the book of Daniel. For those of you who may remember, we've been going through a series on Daniel. And to, to just give a quick recap, you may recall that what just happened is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have been elevated to the position of advisors. And because of that, the Chaldeans who were looked over for that position are very upset with them. They keep trying to one-up them. And so one of the things that they do in this is that Nebuchadnezzar has issued this order that everybody has to bow down and worship this idol that he has made when he plays the music. And because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego worship the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the law of Moses very clearly states that you shall have no other gods before me, you shall worship no graven image. When time comes to worship, they don't worship. And so because of that, 
the king comes back to them and he likes them and he favors them. And he says, so look, if you guys, you just go ahead and worship now. We'll just forget this whole thing. And then we see their reaction here in the book of Daniel in chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Whoop. In se- Sorry, wrong graphic there. So uh, Daniel three sixteen through 18, where he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Wow. I mean, you talk about some moral conviction and courage. You want to know what faith looks like? That's it right there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, looking at the most powerful man on earth at the time, the person who is the ruler over the Babylonian Empire, and saying, we don't serve your gods. We serve our God, and we're not going to serve anybody else's. And if that means you throw us into the furnace, that means you throw us into the furnace. You see, this is what's so astounding about this, because they say afterward, even we believe that God can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we are not going to obey your gods because our God teaches us that that's not right. Man, that is a level of faith that I aspire to get to. That even when they are faced with the prospect of death, that they look this guy in the eye and say, we're not going to do it. Our God teaches us that that's wrong. And even if he doesn't deliver us, even if he doesn't protect us, then we're still not going to worship your gods. See, this is the difference in somebody that is in it for obedience and somebody that is in it for self-interest. There's unfortunately a movement out there among some in the Christian community that they basically think of God as a giant vending machine, that if they just get the right combination of things that they need to do with a vending machine, of course, that would be insert the right amount of money and then make your selection and press what you want and God just gives you what you want. That's not how God works. They believe that God can save them. They believe that God will save them. They say that our God is perfectly capable of delivering us out of your hands. But whether he does or not really isn't contingent upon our obedience. God may save us. God may not save us. But whether or not we get something out of this, we're going to do the right thing. Obedience is just that important to us. That when they're faced with the option of you being killed and burned alive in a furnace and obeying God, they say, yeah, we we choose to obey God. That's the option that we feel is better. That takes an incredible amount of faith. They're saying whether we get anything out of it or not, that's really immaterial. We're going to do what God said to do. We're going to do the right thing because it is the right thing to do and because that is what our God instructs us to do. And this is something that I'm sure the king was pretty stunned at because nobody dies for a pagan god. I mean, they just don't. The king basically reflects that sentiment where he says, what god can deliver you out of my hand? In other words, he's saying that there's not a god that exists that is more powerful than me. They have no more ability to protect you than I do to take your life. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar, even though he's a pagan that does worship go- uh, pagan gods, that's what he believes. And so he believes that he is stronger than any of the pagan gods out there, that he has more powerful power than they do. And these three men from Israel are saying, no, our God's more powerful than you are. Sorry, you're wrong about that. And if we have to choose between looking out for our own skin and obeying our God, we're going to pick o- obeying our God every single time. Because he is the one true powerful God, and that is what we're supposed to do as those who serve him. And Lewis observed in this particular, uh, in in one of his books called The Screwtape Letters. And you have to remember, Lewis is writing from the perspective of an older demon teaching a younger demon how to tempt. So when he says this, he's saying it as though he were a demon instructing a younger demon. 
And this is not a exact quote. This is a paraphrase, but he essentially says that our position is never in more danger than when a soul feels abandoned and has no reason to believe that they will be cared for or rewarded and obeys anyway. So even when you're at your lowest and you feel like God is not there, he's not looking out for you, he's not going to protect you, and you still obey anyway because you believe it's the right thing to do and you believe that God is supposed to be Lord over your life and that his advice for you is better than anything you could come up with on your own, that is where the demons are terrified. At that point, they've pretty much lost you. And they know that. And that's why Lewis asserts it the way that he does in the screw tape letters. Because if, you, as a Christian, you reach the spiritual maturity to say, look, whether I get anything out of this or not, whether or not God actually protects me, even when you feel as though God has completely abandoned you, like, by the way, Jesus did on the cross, you still say, but obedience is important enough that it doesn't matter. Obeying God and doing what my father asked me to do is more important than what I get out of it. Even if it feels like he's not there for me and he's not looking out for me and he's abandoned me, I still choose to, to obey God. See, that's the difference in somebody that adheres to a prosperity gospel and somebody that cares about actually doing what the Lord and creator of this universe instructed us to do. It really is an amazing thing that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were able to do this. And you have to commend their faith and respect it. It's the kind of faith that every single one of us should have. And by the way, it is also the way that Jesus instructed us. This is the way that we're supposed to live. In fact, he said the way that we're going to be able to distinguish those that are actually of his flock and those that aren't, those that are going to be saved and those that are not, he said that it is not those who are going to say to me, Lord, Lord, but those who do the will of my Father. That's the one that's going to be saved. That's the one that's going to be entering into the kingdom of heaven. And so this is the calling that we are given to as well. That we as Christians, whether you're talking about a Jew living back in ancient Babylon, being a foreigner in a foreign land, or a Christian who is a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, living in this foreign land of this earth, we are called to be obedient no matter where we are or what we're threatened with. Because to God, obedience is just that important, and it's what he calls us to do. Stay the course, friends.